Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. This episode will be good for uh, life insurance credit in all jurisdictions. It'll be good for an accident and sickness credit in Alberta. It'll be good for a financial planning credit from FP Canada and an IAS or advocates credit as well. No IROC credits today. Uh, this content is probably not good for IROC credits. I talked last time about not submitting a, an episode for IROC credits because of the cost and my budget. Uh, but in this case, it's really about just the content. I don't think matches what uh, CCAP, which is the accrediting body for IROC credits, is looking for. In this episode, I'm going to talk to Trevor Schoenwild, and this is different from anything I've done. I, it's a little bit of a departure for me, and I think you'll hear in the interview that I'm a little bit outside my comfort zone sometimes here. Uh, Trevor is an impact entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur who has started a company called Moncuri. Very interesting, nice uh, Canadian success story. And I think a, a good example of the kind of thing that a globally minded Canadian would come up with. So I, I really enjoyed it. I'm excited by it. I, I wanted uh, Trevor on here for that reason. It's an interview that I would expect to hear on uh, Jason Brera's FinTech Impact podcast, uh, but I haven't yet. So I thought I would bring Trevor on here. And there is some good stuff in here. I think there's a tool for financial advisors. There are a few people I'm going to specifically reach out to because they have talked to me about something like what Trevor has here and see if they're uh, keen to meet up with Trevor. Um, the object for today, before we get into the interview, the object for today is a coin. So you'll see right here, sort of a row of commemorative coins. I've pulled one out of the set of commemorative coins. It's actually my wife's coin. And that is the coin, the focus is a little rough there, of the uh, Royal Canadian Medical Services Association. Uh, my wife was a um, medic in the Canadian Armed Forces and later on a physician assistant in the Canadian Armed Forces. And as you can see, um, both where we are there, both of us have accumulated a set of coins. It's not unusual at all that uh, when you do something noteworthy or join an organization or for any variety of reasons that you get a coin. And there's even a military tradition called coining where if you're in the mess with somebody and you present them with a coin, you show them, look, I'm carrying my coin on me that if they are not carrying their coin, that you they have to buy you uh, a round. And if they are carrying their coin, then you would buy them a round. So it's a, sometimes called the challenge coin for that reason. I know that's a little bit off topic, but as anybody who knows me knows, I like my little digressions here and there. Uh, with that, let's roll into the interview and hear what Trevor has to say. Hi, I'm here today with Trevor Schoenweil. I Do I have that name right, Trevor, your last name? I've never actually tried. John uh, Will. <laughs> John Will, thanks. Okay. And uh, Trevor is the uh, founder and CEO at Moncury, which is a, going to say a personal finance app. I don't, that's not quite right. I think you're going to correct me there. Trevor, how do you actually um, sort of package Moncury when you're describing it? Yeah, kind of the tagline that we go and use is Moncure is a mobile e-learning app focused on financial education and inclusion. Perfect. Uh, so I know that you have an origin story that sort of ties into how this all came about. Can you just take us through that origin story a little bit? Um, sure. So I guess to go and lead into that, I'll give a bit about my background. So I'm now 25 years old. Um, I went to university up at Carleton um, in Ottawa. So I studied economic and global politics. When I was in university, I was really interested in the impact investing and the idea of for-profit businesses making a positive impact on society and the environment. Um, so when I went and finished my degree, I went off to Cambodia to go and work at an impact investment bank. Um, this company was called Blue Orchard. So there, my job, so this was based in Cambodia and we looked at a lot of microfinance banks and institutions across Southeast Asia. My job was to go and look at the portfolio allocations and also follow up with the different microfinance banks there and see why they were late on repayments and any issues that they were going and having. From those conversations with the different MFIs, seeing what was going on with them, um, financial education was really highlighted as a big issue for them, whether it was an economic shock came through and then their users and borrowers weren't able to go and repay because they weren't financially prepared for something like that, or understanding how different financial terms worked, applying for new products and services, 
adopting to digital banking or online services. There's a lot of issues happening there. Um, so that's what kind of inspired me to get into the whole Moncari stuff. And we actually had uh, David O'Leary on. I don't know if you know David or not, back in uh, season three, and he gave us a good primer on impact investing. So I'll link to that episode here and folks can delve into that. Um, maybe you want to, I don't know, give your thoughts about impact investing, what that really means? Um, yeah, so the way that I understand it, impact investing is least is there's kind of three core components. Um, one, it's investing into for-profit businesses. Um, the second part is these businesses are actively trying to go and make a positive impact on uh, environmental, social, or governance standards. And then these impacts are quantifiable and measurable. So they're actively tracking these impacts that they're making. Perfect, right? You don't, uh, if you don't measure it, you're not, you don't care about it, right? What, I can't remember what the proper quote here is, but have to measure it. So yeah, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, this led to the development of Moncuri, and I, uh, I didn't actually know until you and I just chatted a minute ago. I thought it was all just Canadian, but you've got Moncuri as this presence that's uh, available for lots of folks around the world. Can you talk a little bit about what it actually is? Yeah, so um, so what the mobile app is, is it's, again, a mobile app. We focus on financial education and inclusion. Um, if anyone's familiar with Duolingo, you can kind of think of Duolingo, but for finance. So we go and take different financial concepts and break them down to different categories. So we'll have things like investing, savings, um, money mindfulness, uh, financial planning, things like that. These concepts are then broken down to smaller modules. It'll take a user around five to 10 minutes to complete. As they're going through the lesson, it's a lot of skill testing questions. So you're um, answering multiple, multiple choice questions, true and false, um, going and having lots of animations, graphics, videos, um, we really try and gamify the lessons as much as possible to go and keep it engaging for the user. Yeah, and I, I've gone through some of the modules on it, and it seems like the questions are more designed to just keep you moving along, right? Like it's that gamification. It's not you're not you're not doing you're not pulling your calculator to answer the questions while you're going through this uh, these learning modules, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the lessons we have on the app right now are kind of basic financial literacy lessons. Um, we don't get into too many complicated scenarios or building in lots of like difficult calculations. Our goal also isn't to make people like CPA certified. It's right. go and get a good basic level of financial literacy so you feel comfortable and confident making informed decisions. Yeah. Going back to your experience in Cambodia, you want people to understand that they might not always be able to pay their bills just out of cash flow or that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, again, like the primary lens when we were going and building the app was um, noticing that there was a lot of people that are financially illiterate. Um, the big statistic is only two, like two thirds of the world's population don't have basic financial literacy skills, which is just things like what's compounding interest, what's a basic cash flow, how does inflation work? Um, and this is not including things like how do you go and deal with insurance? How do you go and deal with online banking? How do you go and compare different rates of different terms and loans and things like that? So. Our goal is just build some lessons, make it easily accessible, fun and engaging as much as possible. Start off at the base level and then go and build more complexity from there. So if I'm a user in Canada, which I am, I download the app. Do I have a different look than somebody who downloads it in Brazil or somebody who downloads it in Cambodia, for example? Um, so the app's gonna relatively look the same. You might go and have different lessons for here in Canada. So for example, in Canada, we have lessons on TFSAs and RESPs. Um, those lessons are only made available for Canadian users because our users in Myanmar and Cambodia, it's not applicable for them. Um, as well, if you're in Canada, you're probably selecting English as your language versus in Cambodian Myanmar, it's Khmer and Burmese. And uh, of course, something that you and I chatted about offline was that you actually contemplated this in the original design of the app. So you built everything to be customizable to any other language. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. So we've built the app with localization really as a key component. So on the back end of Moncure, we've developed a learning management system, which we go and use to go and build all of our lessons. Um, it's a lot of drag and drop templates. And we've made this learning management system very easy to go and localize. So you can add a new language, go and create the different components, localize the content, not even just for like the words, but you can also localize the images, the examples, the use cases, um, all of that kind of stuff can get localized. So then the end user, it's relevant for them. Okay, perfect. And for Canadian users, do you have 
other linguistic options? Like, would you have anything focused on the immigrant market for Canadian users, for example? Um, so how we can go and start segmenting a bit more content on the Moncure app for like Canada specifically. So we have kind of three different learning sections in the app. Um, one is the general Moncari lessons, one of our tailored lessons, and then we also have our organization portals. So the general lessons are lessons built by Moncari or some of our trusted partner organizations to go and give us some content. Um, these typically go and focus on core financial skills that are unbranded, unbiased, and are just pure financial education for financial education sake. Um, the tailored lessons then are going and focusing on specific financial products and services. So for example, we have lessons on like wealth simple and quest trade, um, where we would go and explain like the pros, the cons, the costs, application process. And the idea here is to go and give that relevant information. Um, then finally, the organization portals where we can get a bit more customized and segmenting for different groups. Um, so for example, working with like Communities United um, out in Edmonton, and they have a program specifically around um, actually immigrant populations. Um, so they have the developed a couple of different lessons around focusing for them. So in the organization portals, our partner organizations will create their own lessons, distribute them under their own branded portal, and that's where they can get a bit more niche. Um, we also allow people to go and expand beyond just financial education in the organization portals. So we've had um, a partner in me and we're going to a business training skills development program under their own development or organization portal. Okay, so lots of customization there, lots of flexibility. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now you talked about, for example, the TFSA and RESP modules in there. Do you have subject matter experts? Do you call from government websites? How do you actually build the content for that kind of thing? Yeah, so the content development process at Moncari, um, some of it's built in-house, some of it's built by some of our partner organizations. Um, so for the RESP lesson, we worked with SmartSaver on that one. Um, and they're an NGO based here in Canada. There's a lot of RESP working in programming. Um, and a lot of that was back and forth where we'd get their feedback on the lessons um, and go and build out the images and the assets to go and involve around that. Okay. And then for yourself, um, so you said you have a, a degree in, uh, sorry, international development, I think you said, right? Global politics and economics, but yeah, sorry, same thing. I apologize. All right. <laughs> no. um, and, uh, yeah, and being Carlton, of course, there's going to be those specializations, those international specializations, right? So um, how tech savvy are you yourself? Like, did you sort of grow up in that world or do you outsource all the tech or how, how does that work? Um, I took a first year computer science course when I was in fourth year at Carlton. I had a D walking into the midterm, so I am not tech savvy whatsoever myself. Um, <laughs> I can get by with reading a bit of code here and there, but when it comes to developing stuff, I'm not the person. Um, okay. So I do have a partner who goes, in, who's our CTO. She goes and leads all of the technical components of that. Um, and then we also work with another company here in Canada. Um, we will go and do some tech outsourcing with them as well. Okay, perfect. And then how much is reliant on employees or do you find yourself outsour like actually contracting out a fair bit of work? Um, so for a lot of the work that's done, so we, so for our international projects, like in Myanmar and Cambodia, we had a couple of different contractors there. Um, and that was more, just makes it easier to go and deal with employment, just going and having them working as contractors. Um, and that's because we wanted local business people to go and provide that localization for projects there. Um, back here in Canada, more like general projects. Um, we try and do as much as we can in-house, but we also realize that we're a smaller organization. And if we can outsource to someone else that has a bit more specialization in this area, then we'll go with that option. Okay. Now, going back to the impact investing thing, you said you see yourself as active in that impact investing world, and you talked about measuring your impact. So what do you do to, to measure impact? How does that show up? Mm -hmm. So um, we go and track a lot of different behaviors on the Moncari app. Um, and the main things we're looking for are financial education. So seeing if their financial literacy skills are going and improving, and then also financial confidence levels. Um, because it doesn't matter if someone's super knowledgeable of this topic, if they don't feel confident enough to go and make a decision around it, um, there's a disconnect. So we go and track how fast users go through lessons, whether they're answering skill testing questions correctly, if they're going and viewing other financial service providers, um, really what their engagement is with the app, how they go through everything, 
um, if they're just speeding through the lessons as quick as they can to go and get the check mark, or if they're actively going and like reading through things, going through the examples, if they get something wrong, do they go back and do it again? So this is like a metadata exercise, right? You're pulling lots of data from lots of users, or is it, and then to each individual person you're saying, are they improving or is it sort of a trend line across all your users? Mm -hmm. So we go and track both. So we track at both the user level and at the larger demographic level. So at the user level, it's just John Doe and we're looking at how John Doe goes through everything. Um, but then we'll also go and look at, um, like we've run research projects around like women's economic empowerment in some of the different countries. So we'll find like specific women, women who go and fit these criteria of they're women in this country in a rural setting um, and they're a solo entrepreneur. And we'll go and run a kind of case analysis with that group. I'm curious then if you have any sort of lessons learned about measuring literacy and confidence. Like, is there anything that, that you think you could teach others about measuring your users' literacy and confidence levels? Um, well, one of the things that we found out pretty early on was actually going doing a timer. So we're going to associate a timer with all the different lesson slides. And that one was pretty good to go and check, okay, is someone actively going through the lessons or are they just going and clicking, like get through it as fast as they can and are they getting lucky at the skill testing questions? Um, because we can't watch them go through the lessons, the timer was very helpful for us. Okay. And then does that, I assume like your partner organizations want to see that kind of data, right? They would want to know that, that you're actually having the impact that they want you to have? Mm -hmm. So we do work with a lot of different NGOs who are very impact focused and they want to go and have those impact metrics. Um, so for them, they really want to go and see lesson progress, um, lesson completion rates, uh, skill testing questions, whether like what's their scorecard for the different lessons that they're going through. Um, are they actively going through it or are they just speeding through the lessons as fast as they can? And then are they going and viewing and signing up for other financial services after this program? Are they taking courses outside of their kind of core curriculum or are they just doing the bare minimums? Got it. So then you have to have robust enough offerings, Trevor, to, to measure those follow-on activities. Yes. Yeah. So we'll go and track a lot of the different like referral codes that we go and send them off to different financial institutions. Okay. Um, and then a couple of different organizations that we've actually partnered with. Um, there's a bit of a data going back and forth. Got it. Okay. It does sound interesting. I'm just thinking about, you know, my clients, like the financial advisor and how they would be able to take some of that, you know, you, clearly like you want to be developing those things with your clients. You want to be developing capacity, empowering your clients, building agency, right? And, uh, you know, it makes me curious as to whether there's anything there, like lessons you have learned that can translate into more of an individual level financial uh, advice engagement. And I, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, well, on that side, so something we're actually piloting in Canada now is financial advisors to go and have their own organization portal on the Moncuri app. So they can either go and create their own lessons from scratch or take any of Moncuri's existing lessons, put them in their own portal, tweak them or edit them how they would need. Um, then they can go and share that with their clients. Their clients can go through these lessons. And the main purpose is, so now the financial advisor can go and look and see does this individual, do they actually go and complete these lessons? How are they going and scoring? Are they actively understanding these concepts? Or when we're having these meetings and they say, yes, I totally understand how an RESP works. Um, but they're just saying that because they feel self-conscious or whatever reason, the advisor can instead go into the Moncuri app, go and check, okay, you actually didn't answer any of these questions correctly, but you're saying you do understand it. So what's going on here? So just provide a bit more of that tailored insight into does this person actually understand. So let's say I'm a financial advisor and I'm interested in doing this. I reach out to Moncuri and I say, I'd like to put this tool in place. So you, so how do, how do I then get my clients using that? What does, do they just go download the app and they find me in there or how, what's the method there? Um, yeah, so there's kind of two different ways for our users to go and get access to their lessons. Um, one would be the user goes and downloads the app, they go over to the organization portal, they type in the financial advisor's name, they click join and away they go. Or the financial advisor, we're gonna give them a unique referral code where if they go and send that referral code to their user, they're automatically gonna be added to their organization portal. Okay, and are you getting uptake on this? You have financial advisors who are now actively using this with clients? 
Um, there's, I think there's around five or six right now that we have in Canada running through with the pilot. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. But it is available. Like if I called you today, you could set me up on there. Yeah, yeah, like um, to go and get someone started on there, like we could get your organization for, up and running in about 30 minutes. Um, you could go and say, if you just want to use our pre-existing lessons, we just throw them on there. Um, and really within an hour, you could have your own portal on the app, tracking your lessons um, and being able to go and send off to your clients. Have folks brought their own lessons to import into Moncury? Um, a couple have. So what we found so far from the financial advisors who've been piloting it, um, well, one of them is just use the Moncury lessons, but then most of them um, will go and build in a couple of Moncury lessons, but then they'll also go and create their own lessons um, or they'll tweak some of our existing lessons. What's the level of effort if I want to build a lesson in there? Um, pretty easy. So we use drag and drop templates. So all it really is, is um, you go and like create your lesson category. So let's say you're creating a savings lesson. Um, you'll then go and create um, your first module, which is going to be intro to savings. And then you go and create your slides that the user is actually going to work through. Um, all you have to do is just say like drag and drop. I want a text box here. I want an image here. And I want a skill testing question. It's gonna be multiple choice here. Um, you drop the templates in place and then you just upload your image, type in your text and then put in your multiple choice questions and signify what's the correct answer. Got it. And I've seen how the app looks like the, like you said, kind of like Duolingo where it's very colorful, lots of, like, there's not no fine print in there, right? It's just like simple images, simple text, that kind of thing. So I guess it has to be a relatively easy interface that way. Mm -hmm. Like the whole idea is we try and keep the app as text minimum as possible. Um, we've seen like the more text you have on a screen, the adoption rate significantly decreases um, because people, when they get hit with a wall of text, are like, wow, that's a lot of work. That's really boring. This is financial literacy, not worth my time. I'm out. Um, so having more images and that stuff does help. And then breaking components and concepts up into smaller text blocks, trying to go and add more colorful elements to it we at least found that to lead to higher user engagement. So, I mean, if it was left to me, I would build courses that are all text. Would you come <laughs> back and say, hey, you can't do that to your users or do you give feedback to me later on that says, hey, Jason, that course you built, everybody's dropping out after slide two. Like, what does that look like? Um, yeah, like we'll definitely go and say to you, hey, like we did not recommend you going and doing this approach because you're gonna have a lot harder time. Your engagement levels are gonna be lower. Um, if you're adamant about going and doing it that way, we're not going to stop you from doing it. Um, but you should expect your engagement levels to be a lot lower than as if you were to go and break it up, add a couple images, do a couple skill testing questions, or a bit more engagement things to your lessons. Okay. And what does that look like from a financial perspective? Like if I'm an advisor and I come to you and I say, I'd like to do this, am I paying you an upfront cost or do I pay you a per user? What does that look like? Yeah, so we just have a monthly subscription that we go and charge to go and have your own organization portal. Um, so it starts at $55 a month. Um, it goes and gives you up to 250 monthly learners. So you can have 250 seats in your organization. Um, your clients can go and run through. If you go over 250, then you just graduate to the next tier. And of course, you're controlling that because you're giving out the, that unique access code you talked about before. Yeah, so yeah, if you have, like, you can even start, like, flowing people in and out. So um, you're gonna have a list of all your users you can go and access in the learning management system. Um, if you go and find someone's been inactive for three months, you might just go and kick them out of your portal. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and yeah, you wanna, I mean, not that 55 bucks a month is a big hit, but you wanna control those costs. That's quite reasonable. Um, do you have a sense for, in terms of like number of hours or that kind of thing, how long it actually is taking people to build courses? Um, so at least for like, I can go and speak for the contents team on Moncuri at least. Um, so going from completely scratch, like what's an idea we wanna go and build a lesson on all the way to the upload process, um, that normally takes somewhere between five to 15 hours. The big variance is just how complex are we getting? How much content's going and getting put in here? If you're looking at going and creating a fairly simple lesson, um, if the financial advisor's already knowledgeable and doesn't have to do a whole lot of research into fact checking and making sure everything is correct, um, 
it'd be reasonable to go and say that within like three or four hours, they'd be able to go and put together a fairly decent lesson. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually thinking of a couple of people in my head right now who I think would be interested, like just flat out have talked to me about similar ideas. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, and what's been, you said you just have a small number of advisors using this right now. It, is, do you have a like a structured method for reaching out to the advisory community or is it just that, just kind of whoever shows up for now? Um, lately, it's been a lot of kind of like cold outreach. So we're looking for advisors who have professional designations. That's kind of the step number one. We want to go and make sure that the advisors on the platform do know what they're talking about. Um, we just don't want anyone giving financial advice on the app because <laughs> not everyone should give financial advice. Yeah. Um, so the main thing is looking at different like designation bodies, um, like FCAC has been, um, one of the things we've gone and looked in through a bit more, um, to go and see who's going and contributing, which resources to there, see if they're a financial advisor, um, and then kind of do a bit of tracking down that way. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And yeah, I certainly, um, this is where I make my living, right. Is in delivering those uh, professional designations. So that makes sense. And a lot of the listeners will, um, attach that nicely. Now, can we look at financial literacy as a broader concept here, circling back to you know, sort of where you got your start? So what would you see as, first off, is this the term you like? Do you like financial literacy or is there something else you're attached to here? Um, I kind of use financial literacy and financial education interchangeably. Um, I probably shouldn't and it probably is the proper de like difference between the two, but um, I treat the two the same. Okay, fair enough. Um, and what do you see then as, you must see social benefits here. So what do you see as the, the concrete benefits of promoting financial literacy? Um, the main things are uh, financial confidence and financial inclusion. Um, so a lot of people are very stressed about going and making independent financial decisions. They find it very daunting. Um, I think around 66% of Canadians are apprehensive about going and making financial decisions. Um, because they're just not sure what's going on and if they can go and do these things. So our big thing is make sure they become financially confident to go and make these decisions. And once they do become confident, then they kind of go and apply for these different beneficial financial services. Um, like there's lots of services out there that would be helpful for a lot of people, but they're just not getting them because they either think it doesn't apply to them, they're not smart enough to go and use it, they're not wealthy enough to go and use it, um, or it just seems too scary. Yeah, exactly that. Um, now, you've used the term financial inclusion a couple of times. Can you just um, define that for us? What is financial inclusion? Um, yeah, so financial inclusion or formal financial inclusion um, is just properly and responsibly using different financial services. Um, so we're not advocating for people to go and take out like 18 different credit cards. That's not financial inclusion. Um, financial inclusion is going and having your credit product, going and having your insurance policies, making sure that you have the right bank accounts that you're using online banking, um, really that you have access to the financial services that will be a positive benefit to you. Okay, and that everybody would have access, right? I assume that's like the, the inclusive part there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of people just either don't have access to them because they don't think it's applicable to them, they don't think that they're wealthy enough for them or whatever reason. Um, so just encouraging that financial inclusion now, financial inclusion in Canada is a bit different than financial inclusion in some of the other markets we work in, like Cambodia and Myanmar, where in Canada, we're more focused on financial inclusion being um, getting you into investment products or going and getting you the right insurance products versus in Cambodia and Myanmar, it's helping you go and set up your very first bank account or helping you go and create a savings plan, accessing microfinance loans, things like that. Yeah, and in Canada, we would talk about unbanked or underbanked, right? And that's... Uh... Yeah, but, and I know that's a different scale of problem in other parts of the world. So yeah, that, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, now you talked already about wanting vendors who have professional certification. Is there anything else you have for expectations for the folks you partner up with? Um, another thing is we expect them to be transparent with their end users and that they're acting in their best interest. Um, so we don't want any predatory like financial advisors on here are just going and pushing products that are going to cause issues for their end clients um, because it gets them a better um, cut or revenue share or something like that. So 
The whole goal of Moncuri is to go and make like informed financial decisions for the end user and empower them to go and do these things. So we do want to go and screen out any negative or predatory practices. So how do you go about that? What's, what would uh, what that screening process look like? Um, as of right now, it's fairly rudimentary. So right now it's looking for professional designations, reviews online um, are the main things. Sometimes they'll go and ask for like recommendations or references from some previous clients of theirs. Um, we'll also go and follow up with a couple of different clients. Like if they go on to Moncuri, we may go and follow up with one of their clients and like, hey, how's your experience going for, so far? One for us just to go and collect feedback and also just go and see, is this being a positive impact on the user? Got it. So is there anything on Moncuri that you're particularly proud of? Anything there that you want to highlight that we haven't had the chance to talk about here? Um, I don't know. I think things that I'm most proud about is like one that it's a thing um, and it's up and running. Yeah. Um, it's been a bit of a long time coming to go and get it to the point we're at now. Um, we're really excited that we're currently going through a big update to our analytics system, which is going to make it easier for our partner organizations to go and track their user progress, manage all of their users under their organization portals, and give them more power about control of things. Um, and then also the content development process, like it's fairly easy. Like if you're familiar with going and building like Mailchimp campaigns, it's the same kind of like drag and drop building templates, or if you're used to going and doing things on Squarespace. Um, the Moncuri team, like we can also go and help you. Um, like if you want to go and do the text and the content, our team can come in and do the gamifications, the assets, and go and build that illustrations and the animations in there too. So we're happy with how kind of flexible we can be with some different clients. Makes sense. And uh, I think my final question here, Trevor, do you have any um, advice or commentary for the advisors who are listening? Anything you've learned from delivering financial literacy training like this? Um, keep it text minimum as possible. <laughs> um, financial education, unfortunately, while it's a super useful thing, it's just not the sexiest topic. Um, and people really need help going and getting involved into it. If you're able to go and break concepts into smaller components where instead of going and spending a one hour session, um, here's everything you need to know, just cramming as much in, um, doing more of a drip learning approach. So five minutes here, 10 minutes there. And then slowly getting up to speed is a lot more of a digestible way for the user to go and learn um, and a more enjoyable way for the user. Do you have a sense? I know I said that was my last question, but <laughs> I, I lied to you. Um, do you have a sense for, like, is your primary demographic uh, quite young or do you cover all demographics? Do you, do you know what that looks like uh, age wise? I mean, yeah, so we start seeing some users come onto the app around the age of like 16 um, up to about their mid 30s. Our core area is kind of mid 20s, um, just finished school or just landed into the workforce, um, looking to go and make their own informed financial decisions for the first time. They have a bunch of different decisions that they don't know about yet. Um, their financial confidence isn't super high yet. Their financial literacy skills are low to moderate at this point. Um, that's kind of our sweet spot. Um, also, younger people are more likely to go and use a mobile app and engage in mobile e-learning um, versus the more like 55, 65 plus retirement age. It's harder for them to go and get involved in something like this because they just don't enjoy the app learning experience as much. Maybe that's true. I could see, though, where somebody with a retirement focused practice could build useful tools here. So I, I don't want to sell that short. I think there's something oh, no, there. Sorry. Like one of the yeah. financial advisors we're piloting with is going and developing a specific retirement focused lesson plan. Um, yeah. And we're kind of keeping our eye on that one as kind of a case study to go and see, okay, our assumptions here are that um, the older you get, or once you get to kind of more of the boomer generation, um, their ability and willing to go and use Moncuri and mobile e-learning decreases. Um, so we're really excited to go and see the results of this study to go and see, are people yeah. actively engaging? Is this useful? Do they find this as it works so yeah see yeah that's interesting i'm i'm glad to hear that because i think that you know i think about the advisory community and now i'm going through like i said i had a couple in my head earlier i'm adding to that list of people who i think really could benefit from a service like this so I, i'm happy you came on today trevor to uh to explain this i think there's a good opportunity for the advisors out there who are looking for an engaging way to really bring their like to make their clients better clients 
Mm -hmm. Like the whole goal here is just, they're going to be able to go and provide a more tailored service and understand what's their client's needs, um, what's their actual comprehension level going through, and then also go and improve their efficiency of working with clients. So instead of the advisors having to go and spend 10 minutes explaining the basics of an RESP or how inflation works or savings accounts, anything like that, they can go and have the user first go and complete the lesson on Moncurie. The client can then go to the office with pointed questions that they want to go and have more explained. And it's a bit more of a productive session with the user instead of just, here's this hour long monologue, here we're gonna go and explain, can you think of anything off the top of your head? No, okay, hopefully next time you'll think of something. So. And, and as the advisor, I get data back, right? So I get, I can, cause you already mentioned, I get to see who's been using the app. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you're gonna be able to go and track um, lesson progress, um, whether or not they were answering skill tests and questions correctly. You can go and get like our, you see our speeding tickets. Um, which is, was did the user just click through this as fast as they could right before they met you to go and say, yes, I completed it or, right. uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I might have a speeding ticket for one of the courses I did then, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's good, I appreciate that, Trevor. Um, any last minute thoughts for us then? Uh, no, Jason, this was great going and speaking to you today. Yeah, I really appreciate your time. and. Uh, I think it's a, a really great initiative you got going here. You say, you know, it's funny you say it's a long time coming for something and then you're 25 years old. I just don't <laughs> there, there are going to be people on the call who say that I have socks older than that. So, yeah. That's... Mm -hmm. Well, sorry. We've been playing around for like Moncurious is now going into our third year. Um, so, yes. Um, and the grand scheme of things, not too long, but. <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny comment. That's all. So. Okay, um, thanks so much, Trevor. Enjoy the rest of your day. And again, thanks so much for doing this. Okay, so the one downside to that very short interview, it's only 35 minutes of content in there, um, is that to get to our one hour, that means you gotta put up with me for a while now. So I do apologize. Um, and I did think about second things to fill the hour. I honestly just don't have time. I just came out of CFP exam prep season and it's put me behind the eight ball a little bit. So I cannot reach out to somebody to fill that second 20 minutes. And I do have to get this episode into the queue. So it would have been nice. And I might still do this to reach out to one of the users Trevor has on their app. And then there's a couple of uh, financial educators that I think would have been interesting to have on here as well. But that's all right. I have some things to say about financial literacy in general. Um, and you might have heard it in my questions for uh, Trevor here around the validity of financial literacy. And I think that what Trevor has in mind here is just right, where he says, look, I had this experience in Cambodia and I saw people who were adversely affected by not really understanding how money worked. And this is, by the way, very easy for a financial advisor to take for granted that you know, you, you figure that people just understand that if they don't pay their bills on time, that they're going to pay more interest or have penalties, that it's going to adversely affect their credit and so forth. But that's just not the reality. Not everybody understands that. And we should not take for granted that people understand the same things that we do about financial literacy or about basic concepts like just paying your bills on time. So, Trevor sees the effects of that and says, how can I fix this? A classic entrepreneur's journey, right? You see a problem and you come up with a solution. So the education he's developing is to target that very specific outcome. And I think you hear in the interview that a lot of what Moncuri does is very outcomes focused. And this is where we get into the sort of heart of financial literacy. And I'm not even sure that financial literacy is the right word. I sometimes hear financial empowerment used here. So I know that it's very common when I'm in class that a student will say something like, well, we should have a robust financial literacy program in elementary, middle school, high school, that kind of thing. And then people would not make such bad financial decisions or something like that. And I understand that perspective. I think that's a good way to think about this problem. My concern here is that that actually doesn't necessarily hold up. We have a real mixed bag of results around financial literacy education. Now, financial literacy education is only about 
20 years old or thereabouts, we'd find the first programs uh, being done in the late 90s. And by the way, we do have this in elementary, middle and high schools in many provinces today. Ontario has a program. Um, Alberta has kind of a quasi program where it's uh, delivered through junior achievement. So you can volunteer with junior achievement and you can go deliver sessions right in elementary, uh, junior high and high schools. I have done that in the past, although uh, currently trying to manage my time around that a little bit. So we have, we do have this happening. So sometimes when people say that, I say, hey, guess what? Not only do we have it, but you actually could volunteer to help out with it. And I've heard people in other provinces say the same, that they go into their kids' schools, for example, or schools where they know a teacher, and they deliver some training around how credit cards work or how bank accounts work or that kind of thing. I know most of what I did when I was doing that volunteer work with Junior Achievement was around uh, budgeting and a little bit of around what a GIC is, what a savings account is, what a stock is, just a, those basic financial instruments, they, all in a prepackaged form. You don't have to sort of come up with much. You get handed a fairly well-developed package. Uh, but anyways, the effects of that are questionable. So we don't actually know, there's not good evidence, and there's some evidence to the contrary even, that, that that kind of education in high schools might not actually have beneficial outcomes. So what are we looking to do with financial literacy education? Well, I would argue, and there is some evidence to support this, that it's more about showing somebody that there are answers available to questions, there are ways to get answers, there are resources out there when you need help. So what we have seen work is what's sometimes called just-in-time education. And this would be the idea that you have somebody who knows they have a problem and right at that moment, they learn about this. And an example of something that a financial advisor will do about this, if you have a 35 year old client, you might give that person the very basics of what a RIF is. So you talk about the RRSP and then you say, and one day when you're 71, you'll end up pulling money out of that RIF. But you're not gonna go into, at least not with your typical client, a whole detailed spiel around what the RIF is. Instead, you're going to just give them sort of the, the very basics. And then when that client is, 55 or 60 or 65, when retirement is a little bit closer and we're more concerned about the specifics, that's when we're going to start to educate that person around that RIF. So I think in that sense, this just-in-time financial literacy education is quite intuitive, actually. Now, as part of my preparation for this episode, uh, I looked at financial literacy. I just went to SSRN, which is a sort of database of scientific papers, although in their raw form, this doesn't have the uh, peer reviewed version. So an academic can go post a paper up on SSRN and they might do that before they actually publish it. Uh, you sometimes find the published versions of papers on there as well. But anyways, I just searched um, financial literacy on SSRN and an early hit, a recent paper I got here, uh, just to show that there's this sort of mixed bag of, of uh, thoughts about financial literacy. The title of the paper, I think, gives everything away. This is by five, um, sorry, four Japanese researchers. And they say, is the heading, the title, is financial literacy dangerous? Financial literacy, behavioral factors, and financial choices of households. And then we can see in the abstract or in the introduction to the paper, they identify that while financial literacy does help with some behaviors, so financial literacy is more likely to help you with savings and retirement planning, uh, their research actually also shows that there are some dangerous behaviors uh, and they say such as speculative investment, overborrowing, and financial naivete that lead or that come from this uh, high high level of financial literacy. So not everything on the financial literacy front necessarily has good outcomes. 
And one of the uh, leading researchers in the field of financial literacy, that being Anna-Marie Lusardi, um, she points out that there's really this question of financial literacy, that's how much do you know, but there's also this question of confidence, that's what's your sort of willingness or your ability to act, and you have this bad trade-off, and Jonathan touched on this a little bit, or sorry, Trevor touched on this a little bit in the discussion. So Trevor talked about that, where he talked about measuring somebody's willingness to sort of go on to the next lesson and how quickly they proceed through. Um, but what we find here is that people with high confidence and low literacy uh, can do themselves a lot of harm, actually. Um, whereas what we really want here is somebody with both high confidence and high literacy. The irony being that on the whole, people with high confidence and low literacy can still be better off than people with high literacy and no confidence. That is, that idea of being frozen by inaction is not necessarily helpful. And we sometimes see that in this uh, area of financial literacy education. So I wanted to just give uh, props to a few um, YouTube channels, actually, just while on the topic of financial literacy education. And there's a few YouTube channels that I like here. Um, I've talked about podcasts in the past, but I thought this was a good time to talk about sort of educational YouTube channels. So first off, uh, Kent Tilly over at uh, K4 Financial. And Kent does, I, I like his videos quite a bit. He has a, a good sort of sense of humor, and he does, uh, he plays to that. So he, he's aware of who he is and, um, and does he's got kind of a wry presentation here, um, but he does a good job of explaining a lot of different topics. And I can easily see how, you know, when it comes time for me to understand how old age security works, for example, I might go to YouTube, search OAS and get to Kent's video, which does a good uh, financial planning job of explaining how those kinds of concepts work. Um, I always like to point people to Khan Academy. It's an American resource, that's Khan, K-H-A-N, but uh, Khan Academy, to my mind, is sort of the best of the internet. Uh, this is a well-educated fellow, if I remember right, MIT educated, by the name of Salman Khan, and he said, look, I think a good education should be free, and so he started doing it. He just started building a video, started with math, started building these math videos and you can find them on YouTube or you can go to the Khan Academy website and nice little five to 15 minute explainer videos on a huge range of subjects. Really almost anything that you would learn now in elementary, junior high, high school, and even a lot of university stuff on there. So, and free, I can't emphasize that enough, free. So it's uh, excellent and again, to my mind, sort of the, the best of the internet. Uh, then Ben Felix, a lot of you will know Ben from the Rational Reminder podcast. And of course, any listeners to that podcast will know that Ben also does a video series called Common Sense Investing. So you can find him on YouTube at Common Sense Investing or CSI. And his videos uh, do a good job, as you would expect, sort of typically around 10 minutes. And he does a good job of explaining um, although a little more, uh, let's say, technical, you have to be able to follow along with his numbers and his references to academic papers and so forth. But if you're willing to put the work in, uh, Ben's videos are top notch as far as what you'll learn there. And I certainly learn from watching his videos. I uh, always think back, he's got a great video on uh, rent versus buy and something that they've talked about quite a bit on their podcast lately but the rent versus buy, if I recall correctly, really predated a lot of those conversations on the podcast. Um, and then uh, Parallel Wealth. I don't know this fellow. I don't know him at all, but um, he started showing up in my YouTube feeds and has a nice um, manner of presenting and talks about financial literacy concepts in, I think, a, a very useful way. Okay, the number for today's episode is three. The number for today's episode is three.
I just wanted to round out the uh, discussion here with a, a little bit of kind of what some of my lessons learned around financial literacy education are. So if you're looking to do something like use uh, Trevor's app here or whatever it happens to be, then I think that there are some useful things we can think about. Uh, first off, when you're delivering this kind of training, you have to know the subject matter reasonably well, but you don't have to know everything. And invariably, when you start presenting these concepts in group settings, or if you make a YouTube video or have a podcast or something like that, people will ask you questions that you don't know the answer to. And you have to be ready for that. Perfectly fine. I have this happen in class all the time. And sometimes I'll turn around and ask the person asking the question, because sometimes somebody's asking a question where they actually know the answer already. And they're sort of trying to illustrate that they know the answer or they're trying to get to a second point. So sometimes you just turn around there. Uh, you can ask the audience in general. Um, you have to be a little careful there because occasionally you'll get somebody who shoots from the hip and doesn't actually know the answer, but presents like they do. So it, it's helpful to have a sense of who's in your audience and what kind of answers they might give. And you might have to confirm something. It's of course perfectly fine to say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll get back to you. And as long as you do that, so you have to make sure you have a way to get a hold of that person and that you actually do get back to them. This is very normal. I actually have my list just over to my right here of class of questions that were asked in my class last Thursday. I'm going to see that class again this Thursday. And I have two things on that list that I want to address based on questions that came up. So yeah, I, I like to do this and it gives me a chance to learn something too. I think I should always be learning. So I'm always grateful for those questions that I can't answer that I don't have the answers to because that is how I expand my knowledge. And a lot of times great questions, a lot of things that I just never think about or that you would never consider as a, a possibility. And then the student comes and you say, well, let's talk through that. And I do think that even if you don't the answer, it's good to talk through those kinds of questions a little bit. It sort of gives somebody credit for asking a good question. I'm a big fan of people asking good questions. I like that natural curiosity. And I think we should, if we're educating people, really encourage that curiosity. So I tend to be very uh, patient and really try to draw that out. Then uh, something else Jonathan talked to, sorry, that Trevor talked about in the internet. So there's a Jonathan Shunwell here in Edmonton, and this is what's throwing me off. So something else that Trevor talked about in the, uh, in the discussion is that we have, uh, we have to write sort of quiz questions or test questions to test people. And those of you who are subscribers to the podcast and listening for CE credits, you can see how I like to write these kinds of questions. Um, if we're only trying to confirm attendance or sort of confirm attention, then I think your questions have to be fairly short and really can't get into any kind of trickery or anything like that. We just wanna give people exactly the question we're asking, give them a set of answers, and really just make sure that they were paying attention and that they answer the question. Okay? It doesn't have to be an overly long question. This isn't Jeopardy. When it comes to testing for my financial planning students, then yes, you do need to have longer questions that have more content to them. But there even there are still rules around making a, a fair question, a question that can be answered, a question that really tests knowledge, a question where the learner can understand what's happening. Okay, I hope that's helpful for understanding some of what is happening in the world of financial literacy today. And maybe some of my perspective on it might be helpful as well. Um, I hope you'll join me again in two weeks. We have a couple of folks from Sorrell Private Trust, which is a professional trustee and executor service located here in Edmonton, actually. I've got uh, Daryl Johnson and Jamie Kidd joining me. I really enjoyed this uh, session. It's much like the one I had if you were on uh, with us two episodes, or sorry, last episode with uh, Fiona McLean. Very similar type of discussion here where they just know their subject matter very well. They would be great centers of influence to add. So let's uh, yeah, look forward to that episode in two weeks. Thanks very much and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much for joining us. You'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. 
Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview. And you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. Once you have completed the quiz, within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner. And from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord, Renny Wong, and Sushami Pamalupaket are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training, which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals. 